Game loaded. Neo San Francisco, 2064 AD. The world is on the cusp of not one, but three technological singularities. Hi, and welcome to an edition of Lessons Learned with your host, Rafael Pinero. Welcome back again to the Lessons Learned podcast. Today, we have a, an interview with Matt Kong, CEO of Midmoss and one of the creators of Read Only Memories, a cyberpunk adventure. So let's get to it, uh, Matt. Um, first of all, I found the idea of the game very interesting because as soon as I started playing it, it reminded me of one particular game. I played a lot of entry games. But the one that it reminded me of was Neuromancer. For people who don't know, Neuromancer is not only the seminal work uh, in cyberpunk subgenre, but it also created a point-and-click adventure that came out in the 1980s for home computers and PC, such as the Commodore 64, the Apple II, and the IBM PC back in the day. And when I started playing your game, it, it just brought me back immediately to that particular game. Have you heard of it? Have you, had you played it before? Yeah, um, I'm familiar with that, and we actually have some Neuromancer uh, references in the game. Um, you know, growing up, I was, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of point-and-click adventure games, but I never really got into the fantasy genre, but I loved cyberpunk. I love, you know, Snatcher, Rise of the Dragon, um, um, Blade Runner game. Uh, I just love kind of the idea of, of you know, uh, Shadowrun. I love the idea of kind of just diving into this kind of near future world where, you know, it's based off of reality. And I think you can make logical steps in terms of like what this new world looks like. And um, it's something that I feel is a lot more you can imagine yourself being there. You can imagine kind of what that world is. Um, and, yeah, I think that to me is a little bit more exciting than, than a strict fantasy setting. And, um, yeah, I just kind of love the the, the neon and the, and the grit and the you know, the, the pipes and, and, and just all the, the, the smog and just all that stuff that, that makes up, um, you know, that cyberpunk world. Which is interesting because the world of read-only memories in the late 21st century, near future, perhaps in the next generation, we'll probably see something like that, is very colorful. It's the, the bright palette, you know, it's retro in the sense that it feels like something out of, you know, 8-bit, maybe early 16-bit art. But it's very colorful, so it doesn't necessarily have that sort of noir feeling of cyberpunk. The themes are there, the characters are certainly there, but it's very bright. So it has a sort of a strong Japanese influence as well, maybe a little bit kawaii in the way it approaches it. Uh, was that a deliberate uh, deviation or simply this is a, the way we're doing things and we go from there? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I think when we first started working on it, you know, we definitely wanted to make... A cyberpunk game and that was the idea behind you know the production of it and we were looking at all of these old games for ideas and you know what we're trying to kind of make but all of the worlds seemed very depressing very bleak uh that there wasn't a lot of hope in that world and you know one thing that we really wanted to do was paint uh, a future that is both realistic but optimistic in terms of, you know, that we still have our, you know, the environment is still okay. There's still, like, you know, parks and, um, you know, it's not overrun with people. And I, th I think that although those are really fun and interesting scenarios to explore, uh, I think that realistically, you know, in the same way where if you look at Blade Runner, it was, you know, anticipating that around this time, the, you know, we'd have all these wild and, and wacky things that, you know, obviously are not in place. And I think that, you know, looking forward at 50 years from now, I don't think that the, the city and the architecture and all those things are going to change that dramatically uh, in 50 years. And I think that, you know, we wanted to create something that's both realistic, but also, you know, we wanted to create kind of basically like bubblegum cyberpunk, where our game has a lot of you know, anime influence, uh, you know, bubblegum crisis, kind of anime style cyberpunk uh, mixed in with our world. And that allows, I think, for it to be, you know, fun and cute and accessible and not oppressive um, while still having that cyberpunk kind of underpinnings of, of you know, 
what the plot is and the characters and kind of where the plot goes um, while still being fun and and I don't know like I love I love kawaii I love cute I love you know I think that we all like cute things out, out here at mid boss and so I think we wanted to create a world that was not um, too you know overly oppressive and just like beats you down everywhere you go uh, we wanted that to be a little bit more sparse so that way when it does happen it's more impactful and there's and this is a bit of a minor spoiler but you can see it in the opening sequence of the game so not a huge spoiler the cutest of them all is of course Turing the soul if you will of uh, read only memories a, a nascent AI what went into the design of, of Turing because his face is extremely expressive, right? Everything that he does, or it does, uh, let's not gender it just yet. We're going to be talking about it in a second. <laughs> uh, everything that Turing does with his facial expressions is very emo- evocative. I mean, all the characters, really, but they carry a lot of emotion there. Uh, how would you guys manage to pull that off? Um, you know, honestly, so, so, you know, we also run GamerX, which is uh, a gaming convention that focuses on LGBT stuff. Um, and so Turing, uh, was originally a mascot that we made, uh, for the convention. And the idea behind it was, you know, by creating this, this robot, you know, with this, this kind of, uh, globe screen face, it allows to kind of be any, you know, it, it kind of allows for unlimited, uh, customization or, or, you know, like whatever we want to kind of do with his face, uh, you know, whether it be, um, whatever, you know, kind of whatever emotion that Turing wants to show. Um, and, uh, I think that like, as the convention started running and we started working more on more on the character and, you know, what Turing looks like and what Turing's animations are. And, um, you know, as the convention started growing, we kind of got, we got a really good idea of, of what Turing's character is. And Turing really is like you said, the soul of the game, and a lot of it is that Turing is one of the few characters that's kind of written by everyone, and um, everyone kind of has their say in terms of, like, what they kind of think of, um, like, I, I think that, like, Turing kind of represents kind of everyone's kind of uh, inner child in a way, where, you know, Turing is this really explorative, cute, uh, uh, like, inquisitive, young robot that's just kind of trying to learn about the world and i think that for a lot of us especially kind of those of us who've kind of grown up in the digital generation it's nice to like kind of have like it's you can almost kind of relate to this this robot that's growing up in this digital world and trying to figure out its place um and yeah i mean you know turing was sort of the 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 nexus of it all like we always knew that we wanted to make a game with turing so turing existed before we had the story for anything else uh already done and so Turing already, you know, we had been working with Turing for two years and, you know, coming up with, with emotions and, and feelings for Turing. And, and I, think, I think that's why Turing really shines through in the game is, you know, like that's a, a character that has been around for a long time. And I think we've all, you know, had a, a say and a, and a hand in kind of helping create, you know, the best, the best version of Turing possible. Talking about Turing, the name. Let's start with a little bit of history for people who don't know. Of course, the Turing Test, uh, created by uh, the man of the same name, who was one of the key uh, decoders of mm-hmm. Bestley Park, part of the, uh, British intelligence during the Second World War. He was a brilliant man uh, who essentially was one of the fathers and parents if it, of uh, computing, modern computing and the information age. But of course, he, he suffered from the prejudice of that age as well. Uh, he was uh, condemned for being uh, a homosexual and uh, imprisoned. And that, of course, eventually led to his uh, breaking down and, and death, something that British government is still grappling to this day. And so it makes Turing the man and Turing the name very significant for a nascent AI in a game that clearly has as a, as a central theme the idea of identity. Was, in fact, Turing the robot a way of exploring that theme? Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I, I think that the the Turing kind of uh, just using the name works in a couple different ways. You know, I think that originally when we came up with Turing as the name for the, for the robot for the convention, we thought it would be just a good idea, you know, because, you know, you have Alan Turing who is basically 
you know, if you if you consider World War II like a, you know, we have to win this or else the world's gonna fall into some dark times, uh, Turing basically won us the war. And as a homosexual man, it's something that I think a lot of young queer people don't even know that a gay person basically won us the war and and almost basically almost you know basically single handedly did this for us. And I think that that's something that is a good piece of history for young people to at least be able to be aware of and. You know, I think it's a really cool role model that I think that, you know, because of history and the way that history books are written, not a lot of people are aware of that. And so that's sort of the idea behind calling the robot Turing at first. But yeah, I mean, the game is really, there's a lot, a lot of the game centers around identity and growth and kind of like, you know, coming into your own. And, you know, for Turing, a lot of that is, you know, exploring their identity. Who are they? You know, do they have a gender do they what do they care about and as you you know go on this adventure with them they also kind of learn from you and depending on how you treat them they they be, you know they react uh based off that and so a lot of it is is you know turing is learning about the world around them and as this kind of sapient ai they are are basically like you know uh, a human that is gr- growing and learning at you know uh a much faster speed than humans and so you see kind of the result of how you treat Turing and, and, you know, very quickly in terms of how they, they react and and change. But yeah, I think that like, you know, uh, Alan Turing's story is, is very kind of like central to the, the character of Turing, the, the robot, because, you know, whether it be the Turing test or, or Turing, you know, or Alan Turing's, you know, uh, actual, uh, sexuality, um, I think that that there's a lot of you know parallels there in terms of of you know Turing entering this world where uh, they don't really know who they are. There's a lot of people out there like the Human Revolution that maybe do not want to see artificial life sprout up and um, kind of you know exploring what these new potential prejudices could be and um, you know not just with Turing but also with cyborgs and hybrids and all these different other people that uh basically are the 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 new you know there's still prejudices against lgbt people and people of color sure but it's not as bad as it was 50 years ago now people are scared of these cyborgs and these these hybrids and and robots that that might be you know uh making them feel like their humanity is being threatened but then as much as science fiction is and runs on allegory Beyond Turing, we do have these body modifications. We have the ability to create cyborgs. We have the ability to, it may seem superficial, but keep give people cat ears and tails and whiskers and the like, as well as it's hinted in the game that genetic modification goes much deeper. And in fact, that it can solve long-term illness and heal people in ways that can be done today. But that, of course, as you mentioned, the human revolution, one of the the groups inside the game reacts to it. So is that an allegory, for example, for the one of the central themes of almost always comes up in discussion of LGBT plus um, issues, the the search for identity and the defining of identity and the, and the uh, pushback against that? Yeah, no, totally. I, I think that there's, you know, you, you can look at it in a couple of different ways. I think that, you know, when you look at, at the, the hybrids or cyborgs, I think that there's a lot of, you know, potential for people to look at it as an allegory to trans issues in terms of, you know, like for some, some of the, the characters in the game, like they either, um, they didn't have a choice or they felt like this is the, the person that they, they truly are. And so they decided to, you know, undergo those surgeries. And I think that, you know, although, although there, it's obviously not, you know, one to one, the idea of people kind of being transhumanist and being like, my physical body is not necessarily representation of my brain. And I'm trying to make myself be the, you know, kind of perfect, you know, uh, version of, of who I truly am, be my true self, I think is something that, you know, uh, whether that be, you know, um, having physical alterations or, uh, you know, whatever. I think, I think that there's a lot of, of, you can see allegories there to, to people, whether they, you know, um, if they get plastic surgery or they go and they go, you know, gender confirmation surgery or this or that, uh, there's definitely a lot of, of 
potential similarities in terms of the way that the outside world treats them because they don't understand it. They don't understand the reasons why they might do it. They may feel threatened by it or they may be confused. Um, and, and so, you know, we kind of wanted to explore that idea of, you know, I think that, that as a gay man, looking back at, at being a kid and now, you know, all, nearly 30 years later, the the way that the the world treats gay people is very different and it seems like although you know we obviously are not post uh homophobia uh it's definitely a lot gotten a lot better for gay gay men and and you know and and to an extent you know lesbian women but but trans people are now facing kind of the brunt of a lot of the you know um kind of queer phobia and you know we want to kind of wanted to explore you know what that looks like and why do people kind of fear things that they you know that 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 is nuanced and complicated to to explain and um so yeah i, I think that like you know and and ultimately as we we move forward into the future as we become more and more disassociated with our physical selves and and our brains are really kind of in the cloud our brains are really on you know our internet personalities are our kind of our true selves what is that transhumanist kind of like lifestyle look like what are the potential like what 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 would be the potential uh reasons why people would would be against that and and kind of like what kind of prejudices would would show up you know in in that world where you know people are modifying themselves and potentially because they just want to look that way and they think it's cute or they feel like that's their true selves and they're trying to be their true selves or potentially because it's a long-term health concern and this is the only way that they can survive. And um, I think that's a really interesting kind of thing to explore because, you know, you may see someone who assumes that, oh, well, if someone got, you know, cat ears or this or that, that they just did it for fun. They're just, they're playing God with themselves, but they don't know if, if that's, you know, how they truly feel and they've been struggling with that their whole life or if they just did it for fun or they did it because, you know, like that was the only way to survive or they would have died. And I think that it's kind of, it's always kind of interesting seeing how people think about those things and what their complaints are. And we try to kind of paint the resistance to that as not being, uh, uh, you know, completely, um, irrational. Like we wanted it to be like kind of a, 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 a more nuanced debate because, you know, I, I there are concerns about what, leading going into a transhumanist lifestyle begins to look like and i think that that it's an interesting debate to have which one could argue that it's already happened for years because we have virtual worlds we have mmos or I like to call them mmgs because all games seem to be online these days although read-only memories can be played uh, as a standalone uh, offline where players can project themselves Often within the uh, the gender binary, but they can choose uh, a gender position other than the one they are, you know, their their bio biology. For example, I can go to a game like World of Warcraft and choose to play a female, right? Right. Um, and so we're already having spaces where people can project themselves differently, whether accurately that I think that remains to be seen, but clearly differently. And also, there's a little bit in the game, which is, I found surprising, is that you can choose your uh, pronouns. Sounds like a minor thing, but the fact that there is a rather extensive uh, list of pronouns um, was intriguing. And also, I think, was a, a very nice touch. Yeah, you know, I think that, like, you know, for us, something that we've learned through doing the convention is that, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do that are that are small uh small in terms of like they don't take a lot of effort on our part to implement whether that be you know at the convention doing gender pronoun tags or uh gender neutral restrooms or things like that where ultimately that doesn't affect other people especially you know when, uh, and other people being like you know straight white men or, or whatever like you know it, it doesn't affect what what you may assume to be the core or, or i guess the idea i guess being like people who are who are gender uh who um are cis um gender normative yeah gender normative sorry uh but you still have you know something where when people who uh, are trans or gender uh not gender binary or whatever gender queer then they can see this and be like oh cool like the the in the process of this event like i was being thought of 
that there's you know things here that say that I'm welcome here, that I want that that they want me here. Um, and even if it doesn't, if it's not done perfectly, it shows that you want to do it and you want those people to be there. And I think in the same way, um, you know, with with adding in you know preferred gender pronouns in the game, it's something where if you are a you know uh, male, if you present male and you use you know male pronouns and whatever, and, and you think that gender pronouns are silly. Then you just choose that, and then you never see it again. And great, whatever. But if you use it, you know, then it's something that that you know hopefully will engage you more into the game and the world. And ideally, our idea is to show people that you know I understand that the, you know there's obviously this like large pushback against queer stuff and safe spaces and this and that. And uh, my my hope is by putting this in the game, we can show that it's actually very unintrusive. It's not a big deal. To do this, it's something that any game, every game should have things like this. It's it's you know it's like you know ten years ago every every game character was male, and then all of a sudden you see games that like like Dark Souls or whatever that let you choose your own character, and now you can do male or female. There's still no reason why it has to be on this binary. There's no reason why it can't just be like you know just choose whatever, and you can have people call you whatever you want, and who cares? It's you know like it's a video game. Like let like let's just let people you know. Uh, invest fully instead of having to create something that isn't isn't who they want or what they want to be called um and so that was sort of our, our thought process behind that was to create something that is you know something that can be very normalized it's not a big deal it's not obtrusive if you are you know a straight white male teenage boy from the middle of america you just be like you just you know choose he and that's it and then you're done you don't have to like worry of it. like it's not like we're not judging you or anything i think it's more of just just a, a way to you know, I think show people that you can add in gender diverse stuff and it's not it's not a big, you know, uh, I don't think it, you have to, it's a big deal. Uh, which brings me to uh, another question, because you just said it's not a big deal. And often when the inclusion of other characters other than outside of gender binary is brought into any game, et cetera, or even other media, people say, oh, it's great that they have it. And they didn't make a big deal out of it. I suppose that in my intersection, where I come from, yes, I am a white cis male, but I'm also a Puerto Rican, which within the context of the United States would make me a Hispanic. And perhaps often the way I'm seen is seen through someone else's view of what's supposed to be Hispanic. And sometimes maybe I want someone to make a big deal about being Puerto Rican, right? Sure. Make that a big deal. So finding a balance between, okay, you have it, but we're not we're going to low key it or perhaps saying, well, it's in there and it's important to us uh, without sort of going all the way to sort of something like a, uh, a school a, a afternoon school special of some sort, like the one episode where we talk about the kid in the wheelchair once and then we don't talk to, to that kid ever again. I mean, how do you draw that balance if it's a yeah. balance that needs to be drawn at all? No, I mean, it, it's definitely tough. And I think that, you know, I actually, you know, so we just had GamerX Australia and um, I talked to someone who was down in Australia who made a game that is very gay, um, and like very un unafraid to just be like, this, we are just gay, gay, gay. And like, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very kind of sexualized and a lot of like, um, I don't know how to explain it, but it's a game that I think if you were not a gay person, I don't know if it's the kind of game that you'd play, but I think if you are gay and you're like, awesome, like, like it, it is so made for you. And you know, and he was kind of feeling like, you know, our game was too subtle and it was trying to apologize for itself. And, and, you know, I see, I see his point. I see like, you know, you should be able to uh, create something that is just like, I am just, this is who I am. This is my true self. This is, you know, me unfiltered and people who play that will see that and they'll see your passion and they'll see, you know, what this world is that you want to create and that and 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 they'll resonate with that and and i love that and i think that's great i think that's a great way of doing it but my concern and and one of the things i really want to focus on is creating subversive art in a way where i want this to be a game that mainstream public will not be like oh that's just a gay game that's a game that doesn't have these you know that, that isn't really you know made for me and I think that there is that idea of like, you know, if a game is gay or it's uh, a game that is, is uh, outside of certain, you know, boundaries, then they assume that it's not made for them. And I think that 
you know, for us, uh, you know, there, there's, I think that, you know, a lot of capitalist games have to go through this, whether it's like, how do we sell this to the mainstream? And for us, the money is not a concern, but how do we make sure that we're creating something that uh, non-queer people, we want to make sure that obviously that, that queer people will like and enjoy, but we also want to make sure that non-queer people will still want to play and, and get into and then be like, oh, I interacted with a trans person or I interacted with, you know, this or I, I better understand these issues. Um, and that's kind of, that was a little bit of our goal is like, how do we create something that will not necessarily scare off, you know, um, just an average gamer from like, they see it and they're like, oh, well, that, that clearly isn't made for me. We want to extend that that I think can appeal to anybody to download and try. And hopefully they get invested in the world and the story. And then as they, they do that, then they start meeting these different characters, Tomcat and, and Jess and Melody and, and Sympathy and all these different people who are, have a variety of gender and sexual diverse you know, characteristics. And then hopefully by that time they're already invested in it and, and, and um, they can kind of see that these characters are normal people with wants and desires and problems and good and bad. And uh, hopefully, you know, I, I think that like even for myself growing up in Vermont, I grew up in a very whitewashed, you know, it was like 98% white. There wasn't a lot of culture there. And so you grow up even with the most, you know, um, uh, I think my, my parents did a great job and they're awesome. You know, you grew up still in a, in a bit of a racist community because it's all white people. And I think that part of what really helped me grow as a person is coming out to California and you know, traveling the world a little bit and meeting people from different areas and, you know, all these like stereotypes that you hear from media or from, you know, school, they start dissolving away because, you know, you start realizing that, you know, what you may have learned as an American about Mexicans or what you may learn, whatever is, is not true. And I think in the same way, we want to, I think there's a lot of bad information out there that about what trans people are like, what gay people are like. like and if you are straight and you don't really have a lot of gay friends, you never met a trans person. That's what you just assume is the reality. And I think that, you know, by creating this world in a, in a way, we can hopefully introduce younger gamers and people who are into this kind of world who maybe don't interact with trans people or queer people or don't even think about what, you know, identity looks like or trans, trans human identity might look like. This is kind of a chance to explore those ideas uh, in a way that is not, you know, like I was mentioning before, uh, hopefully they, they don't immediately go, oh, well, this is a gay game. This is not made for me. And I, I think that that's been one of our biggest um, problems with GamerX is, you know, although our convention is focused on LGBT, celebrating LGBT themes and issues and creating that safe space, uh, I talked to so many people who were like, oh, that looks cool, or I love this speaker, but I'm straight, and so I don't want to intrude on your space, or that's not made for me. And I'm like, no, no, like, we want you here. Like, that's the whole point. The whole point is to create a space where, you know, queer people are, are being thought of first and foremost, that way they can have a great experience and they know that they're welcome. But ultimately, like, we don't want to create a ghetto where it's just like, this is the gamer ghetto and it's only for gay gamers. Like, we want it to be a thing where it's, it's, it's for everyone in the community and everyone can get along and people who might are curi be curious about what some of the concerns or um, things that are going on in the queer gaming community, they can come and see it and be like, oh, I, I better understand this, or I can talk to someone who's involved in this stuff. And um, that's sort of our, our goal with, with Read Only Memories is, you know, we realize that with GamerX that there's that certain stigma of it being a gay convention and this and that that's going to immediately, you know, make it so it's, it's harder to be accessible for people who are not necessarily queer or already sympathetic to the cause. And so I think that by creating a game in this style, this allows us to create something that is scalable, can go across the world. It's you know it's cheap, and uh, you know, in terms of for the, for the the player to play, and um, I think can allow us to be a little bit more subtle with you know uh, discussing these things. But that being said, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that our next games might not be way way more over the top and flamboyant. I think that mm -hmm. you know um, there's different ways of going about it, and and mm -hmm. I I don't know if if we if this was necessarily the right way or the wrong way. But it has, I think, allowed us to reach a big audience of, you know, people who I don't think would ever play a game if they thought it was just a game for gay people. You know, they, 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 whether, you know whether that be because they're homophobic or they just, they just assume that it's not made for them. Um, I think that this has helped us reach a much wider audience than if it was just a game that was uh, a gay game.
Uh, talking about the interaction between, uh, well, different people, basically, both in the convention and with the game, have you, you know, have you received a, a wellspring of support or a massive pushback? How has been the reception to this game out there in the sort of the wild, uh, you know, wild and woolly gaming community? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been actually pretty positive. Um, you know, I think that uh, we, we definitely expected pushback and definitely we see that but it it seems like it's mostly from you know that that core you know internet crowd that has been that doesn't really like things like this in general um Mm -hmm. and so and i think that they mostly just don't like it because they see the gamer x affiliation and they they immediately are like well we we don't like gamer x because the things that they're fighting for and so therefore we don't like this um but for the most part, you know, I think that most gamers that don't really consider themselves that political or, you know, they just they just want to play good games. And when they we get mostly good reviews, and I think that a lot of it is, you know, that we created a story that is, you know, um, I, I think something that that is uh, something that, that, that someone can jump in on and is super deep but also accessible uh it's an interesting world where you can meet a lot of interesting people and although there isn't a ton of gameplay necessarily there is a lot of world to explore and a lot of canon to kind of dive through and you know the story has some really interesting beats in terms of where it goes and i think that that for most gamers that's what they're looking for is you know something that is an interesting new world to explore and examine and and i think that you know um you know, for for our first game, I think that that this was something that that hopefully, and I, I think that 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 a lot of gamers who played it, this is something that I think that is engaging, and we see a lot of people who who started up, play through it to the end, and they really enjoy it, and they leave positive reviews. So yeah, I mean, I I don't, I haven't seen a ton of pushback from people outside of that kind of like you know, four chan kind of mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. Um, however, you know, the game is still a bit indie in terms of just the scope of it and kind of the, the reach of, of how many people have actually played it. I'm hoping that as we port it to iOS and Android next month, as we release it for PS4 and PS Vita in the, in the fall, I think that as it reaches this larger audience and we add in some of the more uh, higher uh, cost kind of production value that we're, we're, that we're adding in now, I think that that will help it reach a much larger audience and I think will hopefully bring some of these discussions and debates to a larger scale and, you know, um, the, the, that's kind of the ideal. Like that's that's our best case scenario is that this actually gets to, um, uh, you know, obviously for the studio, I, I hope that it does well. But if it gets to a more mainstream kind of uh, space, like a game like Undertale, and people actually look at and you know start really deeply examining what kind of themes we worked on in the game you know, uh, how we represent certain communities and things like that. And I would love for people to tear it apart. I would love if people were like, you know, we like this and this, but this other thing is terrible and they did a horrible job with it. I think that's awesome. So that way we can learn and do better and I think the community can do better. Um, you know, we're not, just because we're the gamer X people doesn't mean that we know how to do queer, like queer gaming stuff, right, necessarily. Like, mm-hmm. this is one of the first queer, like really queer games on a bigger scale ever. And so, you know, we can't just get it right on the first time. Like that'd be, that's, that's ridiculous. And so I think that it's, it's, it would be great if we could get to the level where people are able to really kind of dissect it and figure out what they love and hate. And, you know, hopefully the game, people will, will be detractors of it for the right reasons, you know, whether it's not just like, oh, well, I hate it because there's gay people in the games or they're trying to make a political message. But instead they're like, well, I just didn't think that they, they represented this community right or, uh, I, you know, this is how I would have done it in my game because that's, that's hopefully will inspire them to make their own games or mm-hmm. the, inspire them to write about it and, you know, or whatever. And, and that's how, you know, debate and growth happens. Um, and so that's, that's our goal is that is to ultimately, you know, have people discussing these things and topics and, and, and help kind of hopefully create some content for that debate. Talking about the, the world you created, the world around Neo San Francisco, I, I found it very fascinating. I think, uh, in fact, one, I think I did, uh, we talked over Twitter some time ago, and the one thing I did say was I really wanted to explore that world further because I found the city to be interesting. 
the music. Uh, who who actually did the music? Because the music is awesome. Uh, that would be that would be Too Mellow. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, and Too Mellow is amazing, and he is our, our our musician who we brought on for this game, and um, yeah, he killed it. <laughs> Yeah, so I really like the city. I like, you know, the contracts between the poor neighborhoods and the middle class neighborhoods and, and the mansions, et cetera. I mean, it was a very interesting place to be. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things that sort of kept me playing because I always wanted to go to that next place and see how it would look and how it would feel. And I think that was uh, something that really shone through in the game. Uh, there's also the aspect of fan fiction because I think there's a lot of fans out there uh, especially fans, whether they're straight or queer, who are really getting into the sort of queer narratives on television, on movies, essentially on games, and they do so through fan fiction mm-hmm. uh, and explore it. There's three characters. I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to spoil who is with whom, but it seems to me that there's an intersection of three characters. You can make a decision midway to late in the game or where one character goes and associates with another character that seem to be ripped out of fan fiction, right? That it, it, you can go and be uh, with a central character and sort of that fills certain aspects, but then you can go to the other character and that also seems to fill another sense of aspect that we see in fan fiction. Was that even a consideration? Or was it was like, oh, well, you know, this is cute and we're just going to go with it. Mostly the, the, the cute and we're going to go with it, but uh, I mean, we are like, I, fan fiction is, is awesome. And we, uh, I, I think a lot of us grew up with fan fiction growing up, and um, it's been really fascinating seeing people create fan fiction of our world. And uh, that's actually part of why I think the world is so fleshed out is, you know, we want people to be able to imagine themselves or, or other characters in this world or imagine, you know, what other places in this world might look like. Um, and I think that's that's kind of like, you know, part of, the you know like how we try to kind of create the characters is you know we we want them to be fleshed out enough that you can imagine you know in your mind or if you want to write something what what they'd be doing next or or you know or or, or you know if, if they were to go to a bar or they were to go to a restaurant what like where would they go what would that place look like and and you know what kind of experiences would they have so yeah, I, I think that you know, and a lot, a lot of the game is is you know written in in a way where it, I mean the whole game basically is like a fan fiction, but it's our, our own it's our own you know new uh, <laughs> canon fan fiction. And um, certainly this game, and it's typical of the adventure type game. One of the things that it doesn't suffer much from is the what are called the developer's logic to solving puzzles. Uh, how you guys navigate having puzzles that are challenging but don't seem to come out of nowhere. Sure. I mean, uh, honestly, you know, uh, I, I don't know if we've done that super well. I think that, uh, you know, we, 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 we have a couple of different puzzles in the game, and um, we actually, you know, we, we made most of them have no necessary fail states, where if you, you know, there's a car puzzle, you know, uh, chapter two, and if you fail it, then uh, the, the, the people that you're chasing get away, but you can still keep on going through the story, and that just affects where they, you know, what happens later on in the game. And, um, same with some other different puzzles, where it doesn't really matter if you fail it or not, um, it just keeps on going, and it just affects the story. And that was something that we wanted to do, because we felt like, you know, having that developer's logic can really kind of break your immersion a little bit. Um, there's a lot of games that I love, like Gabriel Knight, where you have to do some like really random pixel hunting to find something like in the middle of nowhere, and you're like, oh, I would never would have fought, found that ever. There's no clues; it's just random. I don't, you know, like, and it's the developer think where they just they, they don't realize that it's impossible, um, or that you know there's no clues, and it's just kind of like, okay, sure. And I, I think that it's been tough because you know it's uh, I think that that for us, you know, making the puzzles difficult and engaging without while also being like fair um and also finding a way to make it so that way if they fail it they can um you know keep the story going or if they want go back and try it again is tough and i think that some of our puzzles were not perfect i think where they uh you know either they they might come out of nowhere or you know the, the player may not completely understand what they're doing and by the time they understand it then they either lose or you know, or they're already like halfway through the puzzle. 
Um, and so that's something that we definitely are, are looking to fix for our PlayStation version is how do we make those puzzles a little bit better? And I think and part of it is also, you know, this is our first game. And for most of us, this is the first game we've ever worked on. Um, and I think although we managed to come up with, with a really interesting world and, and story and, um, you know, putting that all together, I think that the stories are one of the things that we learned a lot by making it and failing on, on some of them. And I think that that's something that we're, we're trying really hard to make uh, fix uh, for the future versions. Well, thank you, uh, Matt, for this very enlightening and uh, uh, interview. We covered a lot of issues uh, today. Um, please tell us where we can find you and uh, Midboss and Gamer X on the interwebs. Sure. Uh, so I'm Matt Kahn. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt, M A T T C O N N. Uh, Gamer X is GamerX.com, G A Y M E R X.com, or at Gamer X on Twitter. And then uh, Read Only Memories is uh, at R O M ROM 2064, uh, or Read Only Memory.es, or uh, if you go to MidBoss.com, you can find uh, the Read Only Memories website. And, uh, and MidBoss is at We Are MidBoss on Twitter. And so, yeah, so, you know, right now, Read Only Memories is out on Steam and, and all those different platforms. It's going to be out on iOS and Android starting at the end of uh, April. I'm sorry, at the end of May. And then um, 2064 Read Only Memories, the, the full version with voice acting, with some really amazing voice actors, including Lee from The Walking Dead, Lee and Clementine from The Walking Dead, uh, Launchpad, McQuack, a uh, bunch of uh, Chie from Persona 4, Golan, some really amazing people are going to be joining us for the voice acting. And that's going to be coming out on PS4 and Vita uh, in the fall. So lots of, lots of great stuff coming out uh, this year from, from, the, from the 2064 Neo SF world. And I'd like to give a shout out to Lara K. Uh, Buzz or Lara K. Dale, who is being just informed that she's the new boss at yeah. uh, the GamerX convention. Exactly how that, does that work? Can you give you a little bit of detail before we, uh, we sign off on that? Sure. Well, so, you know, uh, at GamerX, we have um, bosses of honor. And our bosses of honor are really just people that are doing awesome stuff for the queer community in video games in some way. Um, so whether that be, you know, we had, uh, WWE's first LGBT wrestler ever, who uh, you know, in that was also making his debut in WWE 2K15. To people like David Gator, lead writer for the Dragon Age series, to people like Anna Anthropy, who are making amazing you know indie games and writing about it. Um, you know, this year we have some amazing folks like you know Catherine Cross and different people who are around the industry. But uh, you know, Laura has just been Laura and Jim together, you know, together. But both of them have really been fighting. Uh, the good fight in terms of you know creating a better space for for queer people and gaming and um, and you know uh, we we wanted to have Laura for a while and I think that you know we were just afraid about the whole traveling you know across the across the country or across the world but um, uh, you know uh, we we thought especially now with some of the stuff that let Laura's you know now personally working on and kind of you know seeing where. Uh, kind of a lot of the, the, the stuff that, that she's been working on and covering has kind of shifted to. She's really been focusing on a lot of more on, on queer and trans issues. And, um, you know, she has a, a pretty sizable audience and, and level of, you know, respect that she's earned through all of her work in the community. And I think that, um, you know, she's a great example of the kind of people that we want to, you know, put up on a pedestal and be like, look, look at these people that are changing the world and are doing awesome things and are trying to, you know, make the gaming world better for uh, other people that are like them. And I think that that's amazing. And, you know, um, that's, that's, that's why we, we chose Laura K. Dale. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that we get to, to, to bring, uh, bring them over here and, and, and have them at Gamer Access here. Well, I think she would prefer a big throne of butts, but that's probably between you and Laura. You may have to uh, make that arrangement on the, on the convention floor. That's fine. But, I mean, yeah. look, as long as, as long as it doesn't go against union regulations, we can make it happen. <laughs> it's great. Let's get the butts going. Yeah. So again, once again, Macon, thank you for being here. And to my audience, as always, if you like this or any video on my channel, please comment and subscribe, and we will see you when we see you. Good night. And with this, humanity's destiny will be altered forever.